Hello and welcome back to my workshop. Today I'm going to be doing part three in a series of videos about craft fairs, craft markets and how to sell stuff successfully at them. Uh, I hope to encourage people out there who are maybe thinking about doing their first craft market to, to, to go for it. Uh, I did and um, I you know, really enjoyed the experience and sold quite a lot of stuff as well. Um, but you have to, unfortunately, you have to do your first craft market and learn the lessons. I'm hoping that by detailing some of the lessons, some of the lessons that I've learned over the years, I'm hoping that that will help to sort of give people a bit of a leg up so that they don't have to learn everything themselves the hard way. Um, and that will get them to be more successful quicker in a shorter time. Um, so I hope this is a useful series. Um, there's a link in the description to all the other ones in the series and there's also a playlist which contains all of them once I've made them all. This is only part three uh, so far. So today I'm going to cover lessons that I've learned along the way and what I've done basically to improve my craft market experience and uh, my hit rate really, how much I'm selling. So uh, part two that I did the other week uh, was the mistakes that I've made. This is largely the lessons that I've learned uh, from those uh, mistakes and uh, what, what you can do differently, what I've done differently. Now, I have got a separate video specifically on pricing, um, how to price your items because it's a really, really important one and it's one of the items that I think gets asked about most on um, Facebook groups is how do you price your items. So. I'll try not to talk too much today about pricing. Uh, there are quite a few items that are to do with pricing because it's so important. But as I say, I have got a separate item, separate video on that. So I'll try not to concentrate on it too much today. Uh, and having said that, my first item is about pricing. Um, so things I've done differently, learning from my mistakes. What I've done is I've added lower priced items and more variety of, of prices as well. So. My first one, my first craft fair, craft market that I did where I sold nothing, I think my cheapest item was probably 20 to 25 pounds. And that's just too much for some people, particularly at the moment with uh, cost of living and, and all that. Um, it's, it's too much and it puts people off and they just move straight along. So uh, my most successful markets that I've done, which have been my Christmas markets, I've had items starting at two pounds 50. Uh, now at Christmas that's really easy, you can make uh, Christmas tree decorations and uh, little baubles and things like that, so uh, it's quite easy to have cheaper items. Um, I have struggled at other times of the year to, to find items that could be that cheap, but it's it sometimes just gets somebody to come to your stall, they see the £2.50, they pick it up, and then I, I've had people who have picked up a £2.50 um, Christmas tree decoration, and then once they're at the stall and they start looking around at other stuff, and they realise that they like my stuff, I've, had, I've sold you know, uh, 20, 30, 40 pounds worth of stuff to them, even though the first thing they picked up was two pounds 50. So have some, have some low priced items to get people to your table. I have, over the years, added more variety to my stock of, of items on the table. You'll see in the previous video where I talked about mistakes I've made, the first cross craft market I went to where I sold absolutely nothing, it appeared, if you weren't careful, it appeared that the only thing I was selling was clocks. I was selling a lot of other stuff, but there were a lot of clocks, too many clocks on the table at one time. And therefore, if you weren't interested in clocks, you just didn't even come to my stall. So have a variety of items. Uh, think, try to think of things that will appeal to different people. Um, so the more people you can get to your stall, as I say, if they pick up a £2.50 item, they might then end up buying a you know, £30 cheese board. So uh, lots more variety of stuff on my table these days. Uh, if I think about it, I'll insert uh, a still picture of um, one of my Christmas markets so you can see the variety of stuff that I have on my, uh, on my stall. I've mentioned this in my mistakes video, the previous one. Um, don't put too much stuff on your table all at once. So declutter the table um, and try lots of different layouts as well. Um, and ask advice. If you've got a partner, then um, my next one is try, try your layout at home. So try the layout on your table. If you've got your own table, which I'd advise you get. Um, and then get your partner to come and look and, and they may have a completely different perspective. 
Um, and it's not about what you want. It's not about what you think is attractive. It's about what other people think is attractive. They're the people who are going to be buying stuff. So ask as many different opinions as you can. Try different layouts. Think about if people are coming from the left, people are coming from the right. Not everybody's coming from one direction. So what are they going to see first? What's going to get them to your table? Um, so I've and also different times of year I have different layouts depending on the sort of items. If I've got big big planters that I'm selling or big clocks, then that can alter how I how I sell, how I set up my store. Uh, so yes, as I say, try different layouts. Um, and, and my next one, which I've sort of covered, is um, try, make sure you practice your layout at home. So I, to begin with, didn't have my own table because the first couple of, of craft markets that I went to supplied tables, so I didn't have my own table. Uh, then I wanted to do one and it didn't supply its own table, so I bought a six foot table second hand. That also allowed me to actually try my layouts at home because I had, I had my own table. Um, I could uh, set everything up exactly how I wanted and funnily enough, once I got the layout exactly as I wanted, I then took a picture on my phone and when I got to the craft market on the Saturday morning, early in the morning, bit bit drowsy, I got the picture up on my phone and I knew exactly how I was going to lay the stall out. It, it, it saved me a lot of, um, it made it a lot quicker to set the stall up. So practice your stall layout at home. I think probably the one of the most valuable, possibly the most valuable thing I did um, as a result of, again, I'm going to talk pricing now, but um, as a result of getting my pricing wrong or thinking that maybe I got my pricing wrong, I sent out a questionnaire to all of my family. Uh, I just used Google Forms, I think. It was very, very easy to do. And I just published a questionnaire with, I think, probably 20 questions. And it was just 20 pictures of my, my sort of main items, an item at a time. And I just said, how much would you expect to pay for this at a craft market? Um, now, it's really important that you don't give them any idea of what you think it's worth because you're after as many different opinions as you can possibly get as to what they think it's worth. <clears throat> and it's it, it, it's really, really interesting. I'll cover it in much more detail in the separate video that I do on pricing, but ask lots of opinions and friends and family will give you their, their opinions, so use them. Uh, another item, sadly, again, about pricing is um, is to alter your pricing based on the feedback that you get from your friends and family for this for questionnaire or whatever. You might know how much time and effort goes into building something, but if people look at it and don't value it, then uh, there's no point in trying to charge. I, I had little Christmas trees, so little Christmas trees like this, and then uh, slightly bigger Christmas trees like this. And then I did a, uh, I did one that was uh, about four foot tall and one that was about six foot tall. And they were made of pallet wood and they could be painted, they could go outdoors. Uh, I thought they were really cute. Now, I was charging, I wanted to charge initially uh, for, a, for a six foot one, I wanted to charge at least three times what I was charging for something this big. Um, because I knew how much effort and time had gone into it. The materials aren't a problem for me because it's all pallet wood, but time and effort and, and stuff that had gone into it, it was at least three times worth three times more. When I did my questionnaire, that wasn't the feedback I got. People didn't place a much higher value on something that was six foot tall, um, on the Christmas tree that was six foot tall, than they did the, the, the little 12 inch one. So that was really valuable information and I didn't make any more of those. So now one that's not necessarily about pricing, uh, I got myself a sum up credit card machine. Now there's lots of different companies that do these uh, sort of mobile credit card um, processing machines. I think there's um, Square and um, there's various different ones, but I, I chose sum up for some reason. Uh, you'll see them in a lot of shops, little white square things that you tap your credit card on top of and they, they quite often say sum up on them. So. Um, it's not expensive to get. I think it cost me forty pounds to buy. Um, there's no annual um, there's no annual fee for having it. Um, and some fares, depending on the crowd and the venue, again, very important. Some fares, almost everybody paid me in cash, uh, and some fares, almost everybody wanted to pay me in credit card. Now, since COVID, uh, a lot less people are using cash. Um, and also, if you've got higher priced items like maybe a thirty pound cheese board. People are more likely to want to pay with that with card, whereas a two pounds fifty Christmas decoration, people usually want to pay cash. So uh, it was very very valuable for me to get a sum up machine. I would say on average over all of the fairs that I've done since I got it, probably fifty percent, 
maybe 60% of people are paying by card. Um, so, uh, you know, I, and potentially I could lose uh, some of that business if people, uh, I did have one person who came to one recently and we had no 4G reception, or it was very flaky 4G reception and I couldn't get the sum up machine to talk. And luckily we were near a service till and they were so keen to buy this item that was about 30 pounds that they went to the service to, to the cash machine and got cash out and then came back and bought it. But they might have just walked away. So um, it's important, you know, to to have the facility to take cards because some people just don't ha don't carry cash with them. I got myself uh, invested in a nice tablecloth. Uh, I think I did that actually probably for my first fair, which didn't do me any good. But it, it's important to present your table nicely. I think a mistake that I made with that one, and I may I may change the, the tablecloth that I've got is. Um, I got quite a light coloured sort of beigey based background one and obviously all of the, the wooden items that I'm doing are quite beige apart from the ones that I paint and I think um, I just recently uh, used a dark purple one that I borrowed from somebody and it really made some of the items pop quite nicely, uh, the colour of the wood against the dark purple so think about what you're selling, what sort of colours uh, and, and make that a consideration when you're buying the tablecloth but buy one that is going to be hardy. I bought one that could be easily wiped down in case I spilt anything. Uh, it's very, I mean, it's a very good investment and it'll last for years and years and years, so well worth investing in. An item that I've already partially covered in um, this video is I got myself my own table. Uh, it's a six foot table, second hand. Uh, I can't remember how much I paid for it, but it wasn't hugely expensive. I wouldn't buy a B&Q paste table type thing. They're too, too, too floppy. It needs to be a proper table. Um, the first few fairs I went to, I didn't need a table. Uh, then I wanted to do one, that, and it said you need to provide your own table. Uh, I've covered earlier in the video. It allows me to do set, practicing my um, my table layout. Um, but I would definitely get yourself a table uh, again, along with the tablecloth. It's a really worthwhile investment, and it's going to last you for years. And of course, it's also opened up the different fairs that I can do that I wouldn't be able to do if I didn't have my own table. I think that's probably enough for today. I've got another couple of items, but they're both about pricing and I've got a separate video on pricing, so I'll leave them for that. So yeah, that's part three, which is um, lessons that I've learned along the way um, from mistakes that I've made, things that I now do differently that I didn't do at the beginning. Um, so I hope that's been useful. Um, if you've got any questions about anything I've said or uh, maybe you're thinking about doing your first fair and you're not sure about something, um, pop your questions down below and I will do my best to answer them. Um, if it's relevant to a one of the videos, this is part three of six, so if, I, if I'm doing another video another week and a question that you've asked is relevant to what I'm doing that week, I'll try and include something in the video. Um, but as I say, I'll try and get back to any questions I get anyway. If you've got time to like the video, I'd really appreciate it. It helps uh, to teach me what people out there want to see. Um, and um, you know, it helps to get my numbers up and also if you could subscribe to the channel that would be absolutely amazing. My numbers are slowly creeping up, um, it encourages me to do these so um, I really appreciate it. Thanks to everybody who's liked my video so far and, and subscribed to my channel. Uh, thank you very much and um, until next time, stay safe.